Yipper went out early. He sent for me before nine o'clock. His intention was to mount his horse and endeavor to get a shot at some partridges, which we saw every time we were in the carriage, but which never let anyone with a fowling piece come near them. The emperor walked on for the purpose of placing himself in a convenient situation, but the partridges were no longer to be found. He was soon fatigued and got on horseback, observing that our shooting party was not exactly after the fashion of those of Rambouillet and Fontainebleau. We breakfasted on our return in the tent. The emperor placed little Tristan, whom he saw crossing the meadow at table, and was much amused with him during the whole of the repast. After breakfast, the emperor had the chapter of Rivoli read over again to him and finished it. We had gone through three-fourths of it when the governor being announced. We made a precipitate retreat from the tent, and each of us took refuge in his den. The emperor was less inclined than any other person to let himself be seen. His conversations with the governor are by far too disagreeable and painful to him. I am determined, he said, to have no more to do with him. Harsh remarks escape me, which affect my character and my dignity. Nothing should fall from my mouth but what is kind and complimentary. He found himself fatigued with his exercise in the morning and took a bath. After five o'clock, he took a turn in the calash. The weather was delicious. The governor had expressed an earnest desire to see the emperor. He wished, he said, to speak with him on business. It is suspected that it was to tell him that he had no more money and that he had exhausted all and that he no longer knew how to act, a matter of perfect indifference to the emperor who would not have failed once more to entreat to be let alone. The emperor played at chess before dinner in the saloon he had taken some punch it was late when i arrived he told me on entering to take my share of the punch but it was observed that there were no more glasses oh yes said he handing me his and he will drink out of it i'm sure he then added this is the english fashion is it not in our country one seldom drinks after anyone but one's mistress it was remarked during dinner that it was the eve of the 15th of august the emperor then observed many houses to be dragged tomorrow in europe to st helena there are certainly some sentiments some wishes that will traverse the ocean he had entertained the same thought in the morning when on horseback he had said the same things to me after dinner sinna cordea seems divine the 15th this day the 15th of august was the emperor's birthday we had determined to wait upon him in a body about 11 o'clock he disappointed us by appearing gaily at our doors at nine the weather was mild he went to the garden we all assembled there in succession the grand marshal with his wife and children joined us the emperor surrounded by his faithful servants breakfasted in the large and beautiful tent which is a real and happy acquisition the temperature was fine and he himself cheerful and fond of conversation he seemed for some instance to participate in our sentiments and wishes he desired he said to pass the whole day in the midst of us accordingly we continued together and spent the time in conversation in different pursuits in walking and in riding in the carriage the 16th my son and i went at a very early hour to the tent where the emperor continued employed on different chapters of the campaigns of italy until two o'clock when the governor being announced he retired muttering the wretch, I believe, envies me the air I breathe. During breakfast, he had called for the Journal de Tabas, which contained the organization of the academies. He wished to see the names of the members who had been expelled from the Institute. This led him to revert to the suppression of the Polytechnic School, which was said to be useless and dangerous. The English Journal, which we had received, was not a bad opinion. It maintained that the suppression alone was more valuable to the enemies of France than a signal victory, and that nothing could more decide prove the real pacific sentiments and the extreme moderation of the dynasty which then governed france it also stated several other things somebody remarked upon this subject that the english papers showed a malevolence to the french government which extended to coarseness and indecency lord or lady highland had with a peculiar degree of attention sent to longwood for the emperor's use a newly invented machine adapted to the formation of ice it was delivered to us today through 
through the intervention of Admiral Malcolm, the emperor went out about five o'clock. It was desirous of witnessing the experiment. The admiral was present, but the experiment proved very imperfect. The emperor, after some time, took a walk accompanied by the admiral, and the conversation turned upon a variety of subjects. It was maintained in the most affable and friendly manner on the part of the emperor. The 17th, while the emperor was at breakfast in the tent, two persons described the excesses which they had witnessed in the army, which had not come to his knowledge. They noticed the numerous violations of his orders, the violent abuses of authority, and other outrageous besides. The emperor listened, but some were so shocking that he could not, he said, give credit to them and observed, come oh, gentlemen, these are libels. The wind was very violent. It blew a tempest with which occasional showers of rain fell. The wetness obliged the emperor to go in again. After dinner, Zaire and the beautiful scenes of Oedipo were read, among which he particularly pointed out that of the discovery, which he pronounced the finest and the most finished of the drama. In speaking of priests and religion, the conversation led the emperor to say, man entering into life asked himself, from whence do I come? What am I? Whither am I to go? These are so many mysterious questions which urge us on to religion. We eagerly embrace it. We are attracted by our natural propensity. But as we advance in knowledge, our course is stopped. Instruction and history are the great enemies of religion, deformed by human imperfection. Why, we asked ourselves, is the religion of Paris neither that of London nor Berlin? Why is that of Petersburg different from that of Constantinople? Why is the latter different from that of Persia and the Ganges and of China? Why is the religion of ancient times different from that of our days? Then reason is sadly staggered. He exclaims, oh, religions, religions, the children of man. We are very properly to believe in God because everything around us proclaims him and the most enlightened minds have believed in him not only Bousuet whose profession it was but also Newton and Leibniz who had nothing to do with it but we know not what to think of the doctrine that is taught us and we find ourselves like the watch which goes without knowing the watchmaker that made it and observe a little the stupidity of those who educate us they should keep away from us the ideas of paganism and idolatry because their absurdity excites the first exercise of our reason and prepares us for resistance to passive belief and they bring us up notwithstanding in the midst of the Greeks and Romans with their myriads of divinities such for my own part has literally been the progress of my understanding I felt the necessity of belief I did believe but my belief was shocked and undecided the moment I acquired knowledge and began to reason and that happened to me it's so early in age it's 30 Thirteen, perhaps I shall again believe implicitly. God grant I may. I shall certainly make no resistance, and I do not ask a greater blessing. It must, in my mind, be a great and real happiness. In violent agitations, however, and in the casual suggestions of immorality itself, the absence of that religious faith has never, I assert, influenced me in any respect, and I never doubted the existence of God, for if my reason was inadequate to comprehend it, my mind was not the less disposed to adopt it. My nerves were in sympathy with that sentiment. When I seized on the helm of affairs, I had already fixed ideas of all the primary elements by which society is bound together. I had weighed all the importance of religion. I was convinced and I determined to reestablish it. But the resistance I had to overcome in restoring Catholicism would scarcely be credited. I should have been more willingly followed had I hoisted the standard of Protestantism. This reluctance was carried so far that in the Council of State, where I felt great difficulty in getting the Concordat adopted, several yielded only to forming a plan to extricate themselves from it. Well, they said to one another, let us turn Protestants, and that will not affect us. It is unquestionable that in the disorder to which I succeeded, that on the ruins where I was placed, I was at liberty to choose between Catholicism and Protestantism. It may also be said with truth that the general disposition at the moment was quite in favor of the latter, but besides my real adherence to the religion in which I was born, I had the most important motives to influence my decision. What should I have gained by proclaiming Protestantism? I should have created two great parties, very nearly equal in France, what I wished for the existence of none at all. I should have revived the fury of religious disputes. 
when their total annihilation was called for by the light of the century and by my own feelings, these two parties would, by their mutual distractions, have destroyed France and rendered her the slave of Europe when I had the ambition to make her the mistress of it. By the help of Catholicism, I attained much more effectually all the grand results I had in view. In the interior at home, the smaller number was swallowed up by the greater I relied upon by treating the former with such an equality that there would shortly be no motive for marking the difference. Abroad, the Pope was bound to me by Catholicism, and with my influence and our forces in Italy, I did not despair sooner or later by some means or other of obtaining for myself the direction of that Pope, and from that time, what an influence, what a lever of opinion on the rest of the world. And he concluded with saying Francis I was really in a state to adopt Protestantism at his birth and declare himself the head of it in Europe. Charles V, his rival, was the zealous champion of Rome because he considered that measure as an additional means to assist him in his project of enslaving Europe. Was not that circumstance alone sufficient to point out to Francis the necessity of taking care of his independence? but he abandoned the greater to run after the lesser advantage. He persevered in pursuing his imprudent designs on Italy and with the intention of paying court to the Pope. He burnt Protestants in Paris. Had Francis I embraced Lutheranism, which is favorable to royal supremacy, he would have preserved France from the dreadful religious convulsions brought on at later periods by the Calvinists, whose efforts together, Republican, were on the point of subverting the throne and dissolving our noble monarchy. Unfortunately, Francis I was ignorant of all that, for he could not allege his scruples for an excuse. He who entered into an alliance with the Turks and brought them into the midst of us, it was precisely because he was incapable of extending his views so far. The folly of the time, the extent of feudal intellect, Francis I was, after all, but a hero for tilts and tournaments and a gallant for the drawing room. One of those pygmy great men, the Bishop of Nantes de Voisin, said the emperor made me a real Catholic by the efficacies of his arguments, by the excellence of his morals, and by his enlightened toleration. Marie Louise, whose confessor he was, consulted him once on the obligation of abstaining for me on Fridays. At what table do you dine? asked the bishop. At the emperor's. Do you not give all the orders there? No. You cannot then make any alteration in it. Would he do it himself? I am inclined to think not. Be obedient then, and do not provoke a subject for scandal. Your first duty is to obey and make him respect it. You will not be in want of other means to amend your life and to suffer privations in the eyes of God. He also behaved in the same way with respect to a public communion which some persons put into Marie Louise's head to celebrate on Easter Day. She would not, however, consent without the advice of her prudent confessor who dissuaded her from it by similar arguments. What a difference, said the emperor, had she been worked upon by a fanatic. What quarrels, what disagreements might he not have caused between us? What mischief might he not have done in the circumstances in which I was placed? The emperor remarked to us that the bishop of Nantes had lived at Diderot in the midst of unbelievers and had uniformly conducted himself with consistency. He he was ready with an answer to everyone, and above all, he had the good sense to abandon everything that was not maintainable, and to strip religion of everything which he might not be capable of defending. He was asked, has not an animal which moves, combines, and thinks a soul? Why not, was his answer, but whether does it go, for it is not equal to ours. What is that to you? It dwells perhaps in limbo. He used to retreat with the last entrenchments, even within the fortress itself, and there he reserved excellent means for defending himself. He argued better than the Pope, whom he often confounded. He was the firmest pillar among our bishops of the Gallican liberties. He was my oracle, my luminary in religious matters. He possessed my unbounded confidence, for in my quarrels with the Pope, it was my first care, whatever intriguers and more plots in Catholics may say, not to touch upon any dogmatic point. I was so steady in this conduct that the instance this good and venerable bishop of Nantes said to me, Take care, dear, you are grappling with a dogma. I immediately turned off from the course I was taking to return to it by other ways, without amusing myself by entering into 
dissertations with him or by seeking him and they comprehend his meaning. And I had not let him into my secret. How amazed must he not have been at the circuits I made? How whimsical, obstinate, capricious, and incoherent must I not have appeared to him? It was because I had an object in view, and he was unacquainted with it. The popes could now forgive us our liberties of the Gallican Church. The four famous propositions of both sway, in particular, provoked their resentment. It was, in their opinion, a real hostile manifesto, and they accordingly considered us at least as much out of the pale of the Church as the Protestants. They thought us as guilty as them, perhaps more so. And if they did not overwhelm us with their ostensive thunders, it was because they dreaded the consequences. Our separation, the example of England, was before them. They did not wish to cut off their right arm with their own hand, but they were constantly on the watch for a favorable opportunity. They trusted to time for it. They are no doubt on the point of believing that it has now actually happened. They will, however, be again disappointed by the light of the century and the manners of the times.